It's a joy to have with us today, Dr. Michael Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds is the Director of Ministerial Development for the Church of God. He also taught preaching uh, for many years at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in uh, Chicago, a 28-year pastor and was a professor for 27 years. So uh, it's a joy to have him here with us today, and it's a joy for me to be able to call him my friend. Uh, we've had many good uh, conversations over the last few years, and I anticipate this to be one of those good conversations and uh, uh, have some more conversations in the future. Future. Um, we have agreed that uh, during this conversation, we're going to go with a first name basis. So, Mike, it's good to see you today. Great to see you, Dan, and always good to be with you. Your train always runs on the rails. So I'm trying to figure out how I can ensure that I, I know my outcome and where I'm going to arrive at. I, I enjoy watching you. I appreciate that. If my train does indeed always ride on the rails, it's because of people like you who help keep me there. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate that so much. Um, we're going to uh, talk about preaching today, and one of the things that we're doing in these conversations is not just the mechanics of preaching, but the significance of preaching. So our conversation is not just about preaching skills, it's about the significance of preaching beyond the pulpit, beyond the local church pulpit. Uh, one of the challenges that we face, um, whether we're rural preachers or urban preachers, um, is trying to maintain faithfulness to the gospel. Uh, particularly in uh, on controversial issues or uh, during times of crisis. I remember uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, addressing my church in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, on the Sunday following that attack, um, trying to find a way to address the crisis um, without nationalizing, um, maintaining fidelity to the faith. Um, I'm wondering, Mike, um, when we how do you see our responsibility as pastor preachers uh, in addressing uh, a time of national crisis? You know, we're just two weeks away um, removed from uh, when the Capitol building was stormed. Uh, it's a very divisive time in America, very controversial time in America. What do you see the role of the preacher in a time like this? Well, the, the, the first piece is that uh, he actually is the prophetic voice of God. And so he must be very careful not to compromise that so that he becomes uh, amenable to a crowd or to a group of people. He must also decide that he's just not going to be liked at the end of his delivery because the place that the gospel is calling him to be at is probably going to be uncomfortable for probably both sides, whatever the pull of the push is, because he's not choosing what side to be on. He's trying to express the truth that's there. So I think that first of all, it's being, it's being grounded in the gospel when you get ready to make those deliveries. And then um, as you begin to articulate where you believe that, that uh, God is at, ensure that you double and triple check on your own biases, that you're not going to now say something that is connected to where you think. Like for example, the 9-11 attack, to dislike all Muslims and to make a statement about Muslims after the 9-11 attack, uh, 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 attack might be your own bias that's playing a role in there. So to be careful to know that there's individuals that made an attack, there's a group that's probably responsible, but it's probably not an overlay of a religion or an identification of a group of people. Same thing becomes true even with the storming of the Capitol. Was every Trump supporter involved with the storming of the Capitol? It's very clear that they were not and that there's many who disagree with it. However, the extremism that's present, that's there, that gets fostered, uh, needs to be spoken to. And so there's nothing wrong with being a Trump supporter, speaking to the issues of extremism and bring it into alignment with the gospel. Um, and so sometimes I think that we feel that we have so much loyalty to a particular position that we also can't criticize it. Uh, I had the joys of uh, seeing an African-American uh, uh, become the president of the United States. I also had the bemoaning to have to criticize him. And so I, my buy-in of a celebration to his arrival never stopped me from being his critic because the gospel centered me in asking the question to what he's delivering, is it right? So uh, no one's going to be happy with a preacher who centers himself in the gospel, but that's not our calling. You know, 
my experience as a, as a pastor of 38 years in South Georgia, uh, I knew that I could get somebody really uncomfortable and even mad with me if I preached on two things. One of them was uh, sexual immorality, and the other was racism. Uh, I've had preaching against racism. I've had people get up and walk out on me. Uh, preaching against sexual immorality. I've had angry parents in my office the next day uh, mad with me that I dare suggest their teenagers uh, were being immoral. Uh, so, you know, I think that what you're saying is that if we're going to be centered in the gospel, that no one's ever going to be comfortable with what we say. I think that is hitting the nail on the head. The other thing, and I think we need just to flesh this out a little bit more, and I think you're dead on here, uh, is that pastors have to be self-discerning. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you talked about it in a way of recognizing our own biases, and I think that's ex exactly right. We, we need to acknowledge that as long as we're enfleshed in this world, in our context, that our context has a tendency to bias us. So we've got to find ways to be self-discerning. Um, one of the things that really I think I find troubling um, in the context right now, and I see this on the left and the right, um, is um, that those who want to speak prophetically um, uh, have basically become court prophets. They're not speaking for, they're not centered in the identity of the gospel. They're, they're, they, they're remaining centered in uh, political realities. Uh, and one of the things that I'm getting to here is the challenge of Christian nationalism, um, that it really, that, that many of our tribe don't understand the danger of Christian nationalism. I see it as a heresy. And I say that as one who is a red, white, and blue American, who is center right, you know, you know me, we've had these conversations. But Christian nationalism is an aberration of the gospel. Um, and so how do you think that we can move forward in discerning ourselves, recognizing our biases, and not allowing the temptation of these um, heresies to infect our presentation of the gospel? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you bring up some very, very powerful questions, uh, Dan. Uh, the first piece is that uh, self-discernment is probably not good without community involvement. In other words, by me talking with you, I become a better self-discerner because you're iron sharpening iron. So sometimes we're not in community and we're not asking people who disagree with us about how they feel. Uh, we need to be in a place where we're talking to people about how did they get to the place, what do they think, what they believe, even if they don't agree with us, so that we can be self-discerning and realize that maybe I'm too extreme Maybe I am too passive on that particular issue. So first of all, it's community. It's being able to talk about all the things we say that we're not going to talk about polit uh, politics and religion. Those are things that Christians should be consistently talking about with one another and with people who disagree with them so they can get rid of their biases and address it from a more biblical standpoint and ask people to be biblical while they're having that dialogue. So I think the first thing is that we are in communication to arrive at the right place of discernment. The second piece is that um, if, 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 if the country said that the state should pass no law that will interfere with the church, the church has to be very careful that it is not trying to make the state the church in reverse. And the reverse sin of that is that, that we think that we'll take a fallen, broken system of this world and make it godly. The reality is we're supposed to have influence over that system and speak into that system, but be separate from the system. If we get incorporated by the system, we lose our testimony and we lose our ability to criticize it. Now, does that mean that a preacher shouldn't run from office? No, not at all. It means that when he does, he has a greater mandate so that he does not become submissive to the state's position Matter of fact, he may have to violate it to honor a biblical position. So what, what, becomes, what becomes very unhealthy for us is then to lift up a particular persuasion, not only a nation so that America becomes godly and all other countries are not godly, which becomes wrong. But the second problem to that is then we come inside the nation and then we lift up a persuasion, our philosophy, being Republican, being Democratic, 
these are being libertarian. Those are philosophies. And then we lift those up because that philosophy will violate at some point in time the philosophy of God. And so that what we want to do is that I am first a Christian and that I might have some underpinnings, some principles that drive me. And as long as those principles don't violate with me being a Christian and my mandate to be a Christian, then I can continue carrying them out. Some people may overlook the poor because they have an agenda for uh, financial and economic well-being. Well, we can't do that. Some people may, <clears throat> in turn, license the ability for people to operate without, with, outside of the means of what is godly or righteous. In other words, act, uh, act in a criminal way. And we might justify it because they have a reason or they're imposed upon by something that's happened in their life. Well, we can't look the other way on sin. We must call out sin where it is. So um, not that crime and sin are always the same thing because they're not. But, uh, but nationalism, we must be uh, careful about because what happens is that we get incorporated into the country and not into the gospel. I think that's well said. The, the history of our nation, throughout the history of our nation, Christian preachers have been strong voices for the sake of righteousness. Um, when uh, Andrew Jackson and the Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, um, we, were, we forget them, but there were many preachers, Christian preachers, who stood up against that. In fact, Andrew Jackson's own Presbyterian pastor preached a sermon one Sunday morning with Jackson in the, yeah, sitting in the congregation against the Indian Removal Act. Mm. Um, uh, of course, the abolitionist movement was a movement that was empowered by the Christian gospel, uh, by holiness and Methodist preachers and some Presbyterian preachers who recognized the humanity of, uh, of, of the slaves. Uh, you had the uh, prohibition movement that was a movement within the Christian church. The civil rights movement of the mm. 1950s was birthed within the black church and also in some white churches. So I wanna ask you a question here, and this is something that, uh, that is not a part of what we had discussed earlier, but why is it that you think that those of us in our tribe, and when I say our tribe, I'm talking about within the Pentecostal movement. One of the things that I've noticed is that as the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s was coming of age and really becoming of national prominence, um, that is also the time that Pentecostalism was coming of age that Pentecostalism was the fastest growing uh, part of the Christian movement throughout the world. Why is it within our tribe that we don't see um, something like the civil rights movement as a revival? You know, we, we like to think about the Pentecostalism as a revival and renewing the church, but does not the Holy Spirit also move in the secular world? Should not we see uh, a, a move of biblical justice and righteousness also as a movement of the Holy Spirit? How do we as preachers address these things? I, I think that as preachers, we must create challenging situations for our church to be on our church limitations and borders. What I mean by that is this, is that sometimes we're not challenged by things in the world because our church, our community, and everything reflects exactly what the world reflects. And so we don't we don't know that there's something so different. So uh, many people that that refrain from the civil rights movement lived in worlds that refrain from the civil rights movement, including their churches. Um, but in many situations, our home and our town don't necessarily bring us in conflict with our beliefs. So intentionally, preachers beyond anybody else should create and pastors should create scenarios that bring righteousness to our church instead of waiting for our church to reach out for righteousness. What I mean by that is this, I consistently had in a given year, there would be 12 people of other nationalities, uh, particularly of other racial groups that would preach for my church. Once a month, I'd have somebody else there because I wanted to ensure that my church would develop an appetite and a palate for different types of preaching and for different people delivering it and with people with different points of view so that it could challenge who they were. So that waiting for uh, your church to somehow interface with a transformation uh, may not be our call. Our call may be bringing transformation to our churches, thereby allowing for people to question what they're doing so that they now 
will launch out into areas beyond their borders and engage things because that's not the way their church looks. Um, um, I mean, that, that, that their church is challenging them on the way their home looks and the way that their world looks and asking the deeper questions. As I think that we should be asking questions right now, you know, how is it that we can be engaged in our society in a righteous way uh, and ensure that we don't just keep propagating what we've been doing in our life already, what goes on in our community and every place else. And I think we just have to be challenged. Preachers have to challenge it with the gospel. They have to deliver a gospel because the gospel is full of these examples of where we should be analyzing ourselves to make sure that we are much more centered about what we are doing. I think that we let the world give osmosis into our life instead of we having osmosis into the world. There's this wonderful quote, uh, preaching quote, that's attributed to John Chrysostom. And I've looked for it in his writings and haven't been able to find it yet. So I'm just going to say attributed to Chrysostom. But that the preacher's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think that's, that's exactly what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. The problem, however, is, Mike, as you well know, um, if we do begin to speak outside of the comfort levels of our congregation, a congregation can show the preacher the door. A congregation can walk out the door. Um, you know, and when you're in a situation, uh, I'm just being practical here. I'm not saying this is right. Um, but when you're in a situation where, like many of our churches are, where they have huge mortgage payments, they depend upon that weekly and monthly giving. Um, they cannot afford financially to alienate people. This takes a special kind of courage. Um, it takes a special kind of courage to, to be self-discerning, but it takes a special kind of courage to resist the powers that be, to be uh, a Washington Presbyterian pastor. And I'm sorry, his name escapes me right now. I want to say his last name was Everett's, but uh, who would challenge Andrew Johnson with Johnson being in the congregation um, or would challenge uh, Donald Trump or would challenge Joe Biden. Um, you know, it takes a special kind of courage. We like to talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost and being full of boldness, <laughs> but you know, that, that's not always the case. Um, I think that we, we find that the challenge there sometimes to be overwhelming. I think what I'm hearing you say is that there is a confidence that comes with, with remaining uh, founded in the biblical message and the biblical text. Um, that there is some, there is a confidence there and there is a freedom there. Is, am I reading? I am saying, I am saying that, but I do hear your practical address that this might be a uh, life-changing circumstances when somebody steps out and preaches this message. First of all, I think that we should be as, as frank with the church when we arrive as we possibly can, that, that I want freedom to preach the gospel. If you find me wrong, if you can turn the pages of the gospel and find that I preached something wrong, I will recant it. But if you don't, give me the freedom. We have to tell people from the beginning, give me the freedom to be the prophetic voice in the church. And I think sometimes we come in uh, and people believe that, that we're going to buy into their particular um, uh, issues that are there. So we come in with, we should come in declaring that we are what we are. So there's no confusion later. The other piece is I think there's three components to transformation that we always have to bring to the table. And, uh, and, and of course, my statements earlier sounded very, very strong. Let's just hit them right in the right between the, 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 the eyes. But the reality is that we have, to, we have to, with our gospel, with our preaching, we have to address the way people think, we have to address the way people feel, and we have to address the way people act. So I think that we can begin to build a, uh, a gospel strategy, a preaching uh, uh, agenda, that says this is January. By December, I want to be able to move my congregation to a new place on these particular issues. So I know they're not there. And I know that transformation and change is going to be too harsh right out of the gates. So I'm going to begin by changing the way people think on this issue. So gospel messages that begin to address the issues of the underpinning of their thinking. Then I want to address some things that are connected to it about the way they feel about right feeling, about biblical feeling, call them back to moral transformation of the way that they feel and see the world. And then I wanna ask them to take action. 
I'm already into the third or fourth quarter of the year before I get there. And so I can spend time with each one of my sermons incorporating some transformation and allowing this to take time to change, knowing that change is one of the most threatening things that people will face. And I can address it with a strategy because I believe Jesus said, uh, at least the gospel does inform us that those who win souls are wise and that there is some real wisdom about how we should be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. You know, this, there are a lot of metaphors in scripture for the word of the Lord. Um, the, the word of the Lord is like a hammer. Um, mm. It's like a sword. That's a weapon. But the, I'm thinking of the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 40, comfort, oh, comfort my people. Mm. That, um, that we do need to allow the word of the Lord to be a sword. Um, but ultimately the purpose of the sword of the word of the Lord is to cut away that which is disease, to cut away that which is heresy, to cut away that which is systemically evil. Uh, but ultimately it is to bring comfort. Um, so in a situation that's highly political charged, and I'm afraid, the reason I want to address this is I, I really fear that the next four to 10 years mm. uh, of America mm. is gonna be what we've seen the last mm. four to eight years. I, I don't see mm. it getting any better. Um, mm. And frankly, I have seen a lot of preachers with fiery tongues um, throwing gasoline on, on uh, dangerous fires. Um, so I'm wondering what would be your counsel uh, to young ministers, white and black, Hispanic. We're all in this ship together and we're riding some really stormy seas. You're the captain of the ship, Michael. <laughs> what's your word to us i think the first word is can you present the gospel at the end of what you have done i think that um i think that one we don't want to compromise our ultimate goal and that's that people come to know christ as their personal savior we want to comfort those who are present and so will our word bring about comfort to them and we want to make sure that we're being prophetic in preaching what is true and not compromising the gospel to do it so i think my advice to people because I think we're going to continuously be challenged into very controversial places, is to come back and say, look, um, let's make sure that what we are doing will we'll, uh, have as his deepest thought that it's a portrayal of Christ and not just the expression of your personal anger or your personal biases that you've been bought in with. Can Christ really come out in what you're doing? Can you walk away saying, I was being like Jesus at the end of that. You know, one of the uh, things that I that I see, a lot of times we mistake passion uh, and anger. Uh, we think that we're anointed when we're really just angry. Um, <laughs> the other thing, as I'm reminded, you know, Paul said to be angry and sin not. And I'm reminded of something N.T. Wright once said when talking about the anger of God it doesn't mean that God's mad. Uh, when you're talking about the anger of God, it, it means that God is stirred to act. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we're talking about preachers, um, the, the anger, the passion that we feel, feel willing in, uh, welling up in us, is not, we, we need to be careful that we don't give voice to, to that, um, that uh, rage uh, but that it does stir us to act. And I'm thinking of um, you and I are ta having this conversation the day after Martin Luther King Day. And the thing that, that always, I was a, a young boy, at seven or eight years old when uh, Dr. King was assassinated. Um, but I, I've studied his life, read several of his, his materials. And so I'm somewhat familiar with, with his life. But the thing that really stands out to me you know, his home was bombed. Uh, he knew he was going to be assassinated. That last sermon he preached in Memphis, you know, I've been to the mountaintop. He knew, he knew he was not going to survive. Um, he provoked a lot of anger. But the thing about King is that he never looked to be an angry man. You know, there had to be a lot of rage in him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but he always made sure that his words were deliberate that his words were well-formed, um, that what came across was the message and not the anger. Uh, and, you know, as Pentecostals, you know, again, we, we tend to mistake uh, anger for the anointing. Um, what do you think about that? How can we 
address the toxicity of our nation right now, do you think there is a way that we can do it without being becoming just as toxic? Yeah, I, there has to be that we can be uh, in the world and not of the world. There has to be a way that we can, in this sense, using the word anger, but not sin not, um, that, that we don't have to be in failure because we're experiencing um, emotional draws in a particular direction. So I think that, I think um, uh, being mad or madness and rage shut us off from being able to think through and emotionally experience what we should be experiencing with God. So I think we have to be very careful that our emotions our, and rage does not carry us to a place we don't belong, but that the energy from tension about being uh, upset about something does create movement for us and that we don't just sit still and do nothing about it. And so I agree with this kind of be angry, but sin not, um, but let the anger make you do righteousness. Let it force you to do an outcome and not just sit back and do nothing at all. So I-, th I th One final question, and this is addressed to the former professor of preaching at Trinity. Um, what would you say to young men and women uh, who are in their first five years of ministry. Um, these are people who have been preaching for some time. But in my mind, preaching is like every other skill. We ought to always be trying to sharpen it. We ought to always become trying to be better preachers. So uh, what counsel would you give uh, young men and women in the first few years of ministry on how to continue the process of improving their preaching skills? Uh, the first thing is that um, uh, there is a very famous statement, you probably know who it was made by, uh, that says that I must hold the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other hand, uh, thereby ensuring that I am grounded in the word, but, but creating contextualization to the real world in which I live in. Um, and so that balance for a preacher becomes very important, that they become studied in God's word, don't cease to just, not just for preaching, but don't cease to, to uh, continue to study his word and to know it. Make yourself fertile. The other side is know what's going on in society. Know what's going on in your community. Know what's going on in the lives of your people so that you can take that gospel and make a direct application to what people are going through so it's relevant. Uh, don't just preach the Dead Sea unless within the Dead Sea has some questions about how you're gonna deal with the dead stuff that's in people's lives. And we have to make it relevant and uh, how, will we, how will we have uh, outcomes to this? So I think that it's having both things in hand uh, uh, in your delivery. And I think also in being fertile. And I think also intentionally making sure that your messages are set up in a way that it works through the way people think so they can accept what you're saying. Instead of having this kind of popcorn movement where we're saying something that's exciting, we're saying something else that's exciting, um, but it doesn't have a gradual movement. We should think about our sermons as having an arrangement that says, this is first, this is second, here. Now, let me, let me, let me drop the heavy piece right now. This is fourth, because this is where I want to go. What's the objective of your ministry, of this message, and what are you trying to do with it? Good hermeneutics, good homiletics, and then just make sure that we're just being as true to the gospel as we can. And when we're not, we repent and preach it right the next time. I love that last statement because I have to tell you, there've been a lot of things I've preached I've had to repent of. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Dr. Mike Reynolds, it's been a joy as always to have this conversation today. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you, uh, Dr. Dan. It's actually my pleasure. You're a very learned, astute, and, and, and engaged in what does it mean to actually moderate uh, meetings and bring the very best out. I appreciate you. Bless you, sir.